Hi, I'm Richard Sever from Cold Spring Harbour Lab and BioArchive. With me I have Elaine Fuchs at the Cold Spring Harbour Symposium. Elaine, all the way over from Rockefeller University, not far to come. Hour and a half drive. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's great to have you here. and. Um, we haven't yet had a chance to hear you talk, but you're going to be talking tomorrow about Correct. stem cells in the skin and the stress they experience. But for those who are not that familiar with the biology of the skin, can you tell us a little bit, the, the big picture of what stem cells are, are doing in the skin? Are they just making new skin cells as the things move up through the epidermis? What's, what are their general roles? Yeah, so every... Uh, four weeks time, you've got a brand new body surface uh, and uh, that continues throughout the course of, of our lifetime. And, um, and uh, we, uh, I don't know of a single case of anyone who has ever died because their stem cells from the epidermis just decided to give out. So uh, our ability of our skin stem cells to regenerate epidermis is enormous. Mm -hmm. uh, we now know that a single stem cell can completely replenish the entire body surface. Wow. And, uh, and the other aspect about the stem cells of the skin is that every time we wound our skin, uh, as soon as you see blood, you know you've gone completely through the epidermis because the blood vessels are located in the dermis below. Uh -huh. And so every day, we pretty much injure our skin in some small way or fashion, and it's your stem cells in action when you see the injury heal. So where, where are they located? I mean, you've got, you mentioned the dermis, and then there's the sort of dead cells. Or, you know, are they evenly distributed? Are there, are there pockets? What's the niche? Yeah, it differs between human and mice. Um, and for mice, the regenerative capabilities of our skin epithelium is largely in the hair follicle because for most mammals, they make hair, they make fur, they don't mm. make, they don't, uh, are not devoid or, or right. relatively paucity of, of, of hair follicles as we humans are. And so for most of the mammals, the regenerative power is in the hair follicle. That's also convenient in that there's a stem cell niche that is in the hair, in every single hair follicle, and those stem cells are the deepest of our skin epithelial stem cells. Uh -huh. And so that's a real advantage. We also know that we have sebaceous gland and sweat gland stem cells, which we've characterized over the years. And we also know that within the innermost layer of the epidermis, your epidermis is about, for humans, it's about 10 to 12 layers thick. And the innermost one is where the stem cells reside. Right, right, right. So, and, and then as they, as they divide, they lose their potency. Is that how it works? Yeah. As they divide, they uh, eventually lose their potency, although they can divide for quite a long period of time. Um, but periodically, uh, the cells detach from the innermost layer, move outward, and are eventually sloughed from our body's surface. Mm -hmm. And as I said, that takes about four weeks' time in a human being, a little bit quicker in a mouse. Uh, but the mouse has a pretty puny uh, epidermis. It's really, uh, the action is really in the hair follicles. Right. I think one of the interesting aspects that we've learned over the years is that is that the stem cells have a common embryonic origin of the skin. And so early on in, in skin development, the, the skin exists as a single layer of unspecified progenitors. And we know quite a bit about the signals that determine when a cell is going to develop a hair follicle, when it's going to develop epidermis, when it's going to develop a glandular tissue. And what's interesting is that in the adult, it is interactions that are ongoing from those early stages in development that uh, stem cells have with their neighbors uh, so that in the adult, there are defined niches that these mm. stem cells reside in. And it's that interaction between the stem cells and the niche that says, you're going to make epidermis and you're gonna provide that defense against microbes, harmful microbes from the outside, you're gonna retain body fluids on the inside, whereas the stem cells in the hair follicle are pretty much dedicated in their niche 
to just making and regenerating hair. Uh -huh. And same thing for the stem cells of the glandular tissue. It's only on wounding that it is a emergency call where stem cells are exiting their niche and migrating upward. And there it's pretty much the closest stem cells to the wound that uh -huh. will go out and repair the wound. And it's a fascinating aspect about our stem cells in that they normally have certain constraints uh, that are imposed by their interactions with their neighbors. But as soon as you disrupt those constraints, then uh, different skin progenitors can become the other progenitor through right. the course so, of wound repair. Yeah. So, I mean, you mentioned uh, wound repair, and of course, the skin is like the biggest organ in the body. So, you know, what are the, what are the challenges that skin stem cells will face that other ones wouldn't? Mm. I mean, is wound, wound healing as a, as a process, is that, does that require a kind of completely new sort of adult developmental program that you don't see in other tissues? Well, what's interesting is you see a lot of these uh, aspects of what stem cells can do in virtually all tissues, um, even in the brain, uh, there are neuronal um, stem cells that can regenerate neurons, but they do so very poorly. There are mm -hmm. very few stem cells. And where um, a lot of what we've learned about stem cell biology and about the mechanisms that are involved in stem cells in action really come from studies on the stem cells of the skin, the stem cells of the intestine. Really, it's the epithelial stem cells that are in action uh, in various different fascinating ways that have really told us about stem cells of other tissues of our body. Yeah, but I mean, they must, I mean, sunlight, unique stresses such as that. I mean, I guess that's one of the mm. things you've been looking at and, and how does that play a role? Yeah, definitely ultraviolet radiation if we are uh, human beings, especially because we don't have a fur coat to um, protect us against ultraviolet light, um, then uh, that's, a, that's a unique aspect. But um, it's not so unique in the sense that virtually all of our stem cells, because they are there, they have regenerative, ca regenerative capabilities, they're there for the long haul those are the cells that can acquire mutations that will ultimately give rise to cancer, whether it's in the skin, where basal and squamous cell carcinomas of the skin epithelium are by far and away the most common cancers worldwide. When you look at other stem cells that acquire mutations, we see uh, that they can, over the long haul, contribute to cancer as well. Yeah, and then, and I, I mean, you know, in the skin you've got like repeated exposure. So one of the things that you, you mention in your abstract is this idea that, you know, there's some memory of mm. this. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I, you know, I always used to think when I was growing up and reading biology textbooks, and in fact, even if you do read biology textbooks today, you'll find that memory is in the brain. <laughs> but it turns out that probably most of the tissues of our body have memory, and that memory, is, as we learn about it, is strikingly similar to the kinds of memories that exist in the brain. And the way in which we started to work on this and, and, and really unearth these amazing aspects of our, of our tissue uh, is to look at human disorders of chronic inflammation. Disor disorders like psoriasis and atopic dermatitis, where the initial stimulus is something that oftentimes we can't even remember what the initial stimulus is that sets off a bout of inflammation. And same thing is true even for chronic disorders the first time around. But then there's hyperproliferation of the tissue there's some redness there from the increase in vasculature. Uh, but then it goes away. Everything subsides. Pathology goes back to normal. The skin looks normal. And for months on end, everything seems OK. And then all of a sudden, there's another stimulus. And it need not necessarily even be the same as the first. The first mm -hmm. time it might be poison ivy, the second time a scratch or a wound. And it comes back. And when it comes back, 
the inflammation tends to recur in the same spots <clears throat> as before. And that tells you that the tissue somewhere in the skin is a memory yeah. of a prior inflammatory experience. And because so, you're seeing something different, the secondary exposure. It's to coming back to the same spots. Right. Right. And so it's like there had to be some kind of memory of that initial inflammatory exposure. So what does that mean? So we started looking at the immune system because at the time people, of course, with regards to adaptive immunity, uh, you see a particular pathogen and you raise antibodies to that pathogen uh, or and the next time around, you have antibodies that recognizes that same pathogen and, and, and hopefully wipes it out. But in this case, it's not the same secondary stimulus. So right. right away, it sort of suggested to us that probably adaptive immunity was not going to be at the roots of this kind of memory. And we went on to demonstrate that uh, using a mouse that lacked all lymphocytes. Right. And then we um, started to look deeper and found that in mice, just like in humans, there are there's this broader spe uh, non-specificity with mm. regards to the type of memory. We started to look at macrophages because there was a group at Yale that had uh, looked at circulating macrophages and first showed that if they were exposed to a type of to, to inflammation and you put the cells macrophages in a culture dish that they change their chromatin um, differentially over uh -huh. time. But macrophages in circulation have a half-life of about six days. And here we are talking about something that's really long-lived if it has, if in, memory... In, in years. Yeah, right. and if memory has physiological relevance, then it's got long-lived. It's got to be long-lived. And we started to realize as we were eliminating what we thought initially must be it, uh, started to realize that maybe it's the stem cells and that's the only that thing that's going to be around long enough, right? The memory, and right. so we started to look at that, and lo and behold, uh, we found that even though the inflammation had subsided, pathology was normal, proteins were normal, messenger RNA was normal. Tick, tick, tick. Started to look inside the nucleus, and inside the nucleus, in the chromatin, were regions of the chromatin that had become accessible from that inflammation, which in the mouse's lifetime is, is um, this was six months uh, lingering, six months later, we could still identify hundreds of peaks, uh, chromatin, accessible chromatin regions that were there uh, six months before from the inflammation. And, uh, and that's about five to six years in a human's lifetime. So we then went on to demonstrate that these peaks have functionality. They act as inflammation sensors. They sit in our chromatin long after inflammation, wow. and they can be triggered. They tend to be associated with enhancers of genes, genes that in a secondary response get triggered and rapidly activated. So are these, are these the genes that you would expect? Are they kind of immune responsive, uh, um, uh, inflammation-involved Inflammation, involved, inflammation involved, or in the case of wounding, um, migration-involved, um, inflammatory responses, all the initial responses of a wound. They, um, these genes were marked by these inflammation sensors. And so second time around, you trigger those genes much faster than the first time. Uh -huh. And it's more robust because the chromatin is already open. And so uh, it's, it doesn't have to be opened up and made accessible. It's poised, ready and waiting to go for the next inflammatory assault. And the other cool aspect about that is the reason why the secondary assault need not be the same as the first is that the first the, the mechanism of the inflammation requires two different transcription factors. Mm -hmm. One is inflammation specific. So there are lots of different types of inflammation. There's an inflammation specific transcription factor for each of them. 
The inflammation-specific transcription factor opens up the region, but now the region is open and there's a stress-induced transcription factor called FOS, which uh -huh. heterodimerizes with Jun. That gets activated on almost anything, mm -hmm. almost any kind of stress. That turns out to not have access to the chromatin. It's responsible for remodeling the chromatin and activating transcription. Uh -huh. And so as soon as the inflammation-specific transcription factor opens it up, FOS and Jun come in that were also activated, then come in and bind and remodel the chromatin and transcribe the gene. But while the chromatin is open, there are other stem cell factors that were there all the time but never had access. Right. So they now see it, see these regions. They come in and bind. So, so this that, recapitulates the kind of pioneer factor that you, we know yeah, about in, in development. Yeah, then, right? exactly. Right. And so now what happens is that the chromatin is open, stem cell factors come in, histone modifications are made, and all of that remains in place, even though now, in the absence of inflammation, there's no more infl inflammation-specific transcription factor, and there's no more FOS. Right. Um, but now all you need to trigger is FOS. The chromatin's already open, so you no longer need that initial inflammatory stimulus. And so it starts to explain why um, plants has been known for, for years, decades, that plants, if they survive one pathogen, are often resistant to many different kinds of uh -huh. pathogens. It's been known that infants that are, that are vaccinated against one particular bacterium end up having a broader resistance to others. Um, and essentially what the um, inflammatory memory does is to afford a means for having the lessons learned in the first round of inflammation to apply that to the next round. And when you think about, well, what's the evolutionary implications of that, we probably have kept this throughout our lifetime because at, our tissues have to be able to heal wounds. Mm -hmm. They have to be able to regenerate. And especially if you're a frog in a pond, you better heal your wound fast for the sake of the, the animal. And so uh, I think evolutionarily, um, it was the ability to heal wounds faster which allowed for this type of memory to be passed on in evolution. And then the other aspect is this broader resistance to pathogens, which again is beneficial. And so, uh, and so now we um, published that initial uh, finding back in 2017 um, on the skin, showing that skin stem cells have memory, but we now know that many other types of epithelial cells, including uh, and other types of stem cells, hematopoietic progenitors and stem cells have memory, this kind of memory. And so my guess is that any long-lived cell, a stem cell, but also a neuron, and this gets back to memories in the brain, mm -hmm. um, the memories in the brain tend to be, as people have been finding them, are, are basically epigenetic, long-lived epigenetic marks. Yeah. So it's a different way of marking them than it is in inflammation, but I think the principles, the fundamental principles, are, the are really the same. So I kind of think that, um, that 10 years from now, maybe, then the textbooks will be the notion that not just all about the brain, uh, with regards to memory. To memory. Well, that I mean, it's a, that's a, a fascinating story going covering immunology, you know, developmental biology, and even kind of analogies to neurobiology and and the the, the, the sort of evolutionary lessons. Um, and we wish you luck with um, the studies going forward for the next ten years. Thanks very much for Thanks. being with us. Thanks. Thank you very much. It's been fun.